Okay, so, so let's start. Uh, okay, so we are talking about naive Bayes. We spent the last uh, lecture, and I want to uh, continue where I left off uh, trying to basically explain. Um, we left off at explaining why things work. Uh, so just to remind us, so we are working within the Bayesian paradigm, and specifically, we're looking for, um, hmm, just a second. We're, we're talking about the Bayesian classifier, where we made this very important assumption that uh, feature values are independent given the target value. And under this assumption, making this hopefully it's better, uh, making this um, prediction can be decomposed because we are going to decompose this this way. The probability of x1, x2, xn given vj is going to be the product of p of x i given vj. That's the key assumption. We, we said also that we can think about it as a, the following generative model. So first of all, we choose the label. Once we've chosen the label, given this label, uh, we choose feature values according to these distributions. And this also means, uh, gives us a way to estimate the parameters. So the parameters we have to estimate are these parameters, P of V, which is given, V, number of V parameters, and then uh, these parameters, P of Xi given V, which is N times V parameters. For every value here, we have N parameters to estimate. So that, that's naive base, right? Questions? As I said, really an important algorithm, and and one of the things we said toward the end of the last time is that it's different than all the algorithms that we talked about so far because it's really learning without search, right? We don't check for consistency. We just believe the assumptions. And under these assumptions, uh, we basically estimate these and these parameters from the data. That's it. And at the end of last time, we try to answer the question of why does it work? And I want to go back to this and some insights uh, that this uh, gives us. Okay. So, basically, uh, the key uh, observation that we made is that really the prediction of a linear, of a naive based classifier is done using a linear function, right? So the decision, we're predicting one if and only if this ratio is positive or this linear function is positive, which means, again, we're going back to this theory of linear functions that we talked about. Uh, and that, that's really an important thing. And now, we also said, because of that, with a little bit of algebra, we can say that we're going to predict one if this linear function satisfies the following, it is like this. The probability of the label being 1 given the data is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus dot product, which is a function that we've seen before, the logistic function. So that's, that's the theory that we developed last time. And this, this brings us to uh, two questions that allow us to, to place everything here in a slightly more general setting. And these are the two questions. So, so one question is, well, if we said that probabilistic classifiers or hypotheses really are just like other linear hypotheses that we talked about before, uh, what about the other direction? Can we also interpret the, out, the outcome of other linear uh, learning algorithms probabilistically? And the answer we said is yes, and I'm going to repeat this. And the second is, if probabilistic hypotheses are actually like other linear functions, can we actually train them 
in a similar way, that is discriminatively. And again, the answer is going to be yes, and I'm going to summarize what we said uh, toward the end of last time. So the first question, again, goes back to this representation, right? Uh, uh, because we can write uh, every linear function that we talked about this way, uh, really we said that it's e to the dot product. What we can add is we can add two parameters. In fact, b is already there if you don't think about linear functions that go through the origin. And we can add this a here and essentially tune it. Tune it on a set-aside data set uh, that you did not use for training. And it's, uh, it can actually be justified, but definitely shown experimentally, that what you get is you get that this really behaves like a probability distribution. So you're going to get a number between 0 and 1, and after enough tuning of this uh, coefficient a, you're going to get something that will behave like a probability distribution. And this is something that is done today for all linear classifiers, if you care about using them this way. Right? If it's... If it's a component, say, in a pipeline, and you care about the, the probabilistic interpretation rather than just ranking the outcomes, then you're going to do it this way. So that's the easy uh, part of, the que of these two questions. The second is, um, what about discriminative training? So again, uh, the algorithm that we're going to derive this way is an algorithm that is called logistic regression. Uh, and again, it's built on the same representation that we just derived. The probability of y, let's say being 1, is 1 over, this is the power minus 1 here, 1 plus e to the dot product. So before we derived it in naive base, where these w's were specific w's. These were w's that were derived through ratios uh, of observations, component of observations. Uh, but now that we have this, we can ask the question, uh, what if we ju just, given this expression, we just find the best W here, uh, rather than deriving the W uh, with these ratios. So I'm going to make this a little bit more explicit uh, in a second, but really the idea is that I want to, this is uh, the probability of given one example that the label is one. I can think about this as, I can use this in order to maximize the likelihood of all the data that I have, and then rather than treating this W as the naive base W, I'm going to find which is the W that maximizes the likelihood of the data where I'm writing the data the likelihood this way, or the probability of the data this way. Um, before we get to the technical things, really, I'm just changing the way I'm training the W. The expression is going to be exactly the same way, but I'm going to get W that is more expressive. We did not say this explicitly. You're going to show this actually in the problem set, but the W that we derived before as the naive base algorithm, do not cover the whole space of Ws in general. Here we're going to cover the whole space of Ws, so we're going to get a more expressive uh, uh, set of functions. In fact, it's well known that uh, naive base, one reason naive base is a good algorithm, even though it's not as expressive as other linear learning algorithms, is that it's very fast to converge. It doesn't converge to uh, the same W that the best linear learning algorithms will converge to, but, to, but it converges very fast to whatever it can do. Uh, so this is one, one advantage. Now, how do we find this, this best W? Right? So that's what's left, the, the technical step. So again, let's think about this model that we, we just derived. And again, remember that we derived it from the naive base perspective. Now I'm eliminating this, and I'm just saying I want to find the best WB, the best in the sense that it maximizes the log likelihood of the data. Uh, so I'm going to compute 
the negative log likelihood of the data. So I'm summing over all the examples, log of this expression. And I want to minimize this. Uh, and this is really what is called logistic regression. In some contexts, you'll also see exactly the same model called the maximum entropy model. Uh, it used to be called this way in the natural language processing community because it was derived, exactly the same thing was derived from other principles. Uh, but I'm not going to uh, follow this derivation. Uh, from our perspective, we are just trying to minimize this sum. Uh, and as we know before, so this is something that really has to do with the, the data itself, right? The empirical uh, error in the data. As we've done already before, in order to get good generalization, it's typical to add a, regression, a regularization terms, which I'm going to add here too. So I'm going to add this uh, uh, norm of W, the weight vector. And now I'm getting, going back to the same type of expression that we've seen before. I have a, reg a regularization term, and I have something that expresses this em empirical loss over the data. The only difference is that the function, the specific function that we have here is somewhat different than the previous function that we had, say, the hinge loss. Uh, so again, uh, right before we've seen L1 SVM, where this component here, the one that corresponds to the empirical loss, was this hinge loss. We also talked about L2 SVM, where we measure the empirical loss somewhat different way, the square of this. Now we are doing it with this blue line. So we had the green line before. I talked about uh, the blue line, which is the square of this. And now what we have is this red, red curve here. And you can see that they are quite similar. In particular, this one is very, very similar to the L1 SVM. And you're going to optimize it in about the same way and you're going to get about the same results. So, so it's not surprising that if you run logistic regression, which optimizes this, or L1 SVM, you typically get about the same results. Or, uh, as we said, average perceptron also very, very close relative uh, of these functions. Uh, and again, the, I don't want to dwell on the optimization itself. We talked about the fact that there are multiple methods to do it. Uh, probably the most commonly used today is the one that you are familiar with, uh, stochastic gradient descent methods. Um, but the important thing that I wanted to finish here with is the fact that, you know, we kind of close the loop. Even though we started with naive base, we show that it can be generalized a little bit uh, and, uh, and give you results that are very, very similar to the other linear learning algorithms that we talked about. Okay, uh, now questions on this, or on this? Okay, so, so we closed the loop in the sense that we placed uh, these probabilistic algorithms in the context of other algorithms, uh, but naive base is still a very, very important algorithm in itself. Uh, partly because it's just doing well. And I want to move on uh, and give a few other examples. So we talked about uh, one very simple example, this one. Uh, and I want to give a couple other examples. Where is it? Yeah. So the lecture notes have... Um, a few examples. I'm not going to go over all of them in details. Um, one thing that we talked about when we started talking about uh, naive Bayes, Bayes, Bayesian learning is I said there is one principle. I mean, we're using Bayes rule, and that's it. The rest is details. The rest is what probabilistic assumptions you are making. And I'm going to uh, show this now uh, in this simple example of text classification. So, so the issue is that we're going to use the same principle. We're going to represent 
uh, everything using Bayes' rule, in fact, specifically with naive Bayes, but we're going to make different assumptions on, how, on the probability that governs the generation of documents. And different assumptions on these probabilities are going to give rise to different uh, ways to estimate parameters. So with the same data, you're going to estimate different parameters, you're going to make different predictions. And you're going to see more of it in your problem set, uh, even for the very sp trivial problem that we talked about last time, you know, tossing a coin, observing a sequence, heads and tails, you solved it one way if you make different assumptions on how the sequence of heads and tails was generated, you will estimate the parameters differently. So let's, let's, uh, let's look at it here. So my assumption here is that my instance space is a collection of text documents. I have two labels. I like the documents or I don't like the documents. And I want to learn a function that, given a new document, uh, labels it as I like it or I don't like it, right? Banyan. And, and the question for us is how to represent a document and as a function of this, how to estimate the probabilities and eventually how to classify. So how should we represent documents? Your first uh, suggestion. Bag of words. So, so one possibility is to just represent a list of all words uh, that appear in the document. Uh, could be a good uh, representation. So essentially, if you have a dictionary of 50,000 words, you'll have a vector of 50,000 uh, components. Some of them are going to be on, those that correspond to words that uh, appear, and some of them will be zero. What are you losing with this representation? Order of the words, right? So you just tell me whether a word is in the document or not. You don't know where, you don't know relative position. What else are you missing? Multiplicity. So if a word appears multiple times, we don't represent it. So, and, and this is really the simplest way to do it. So, uh, a dictionary of n words, therefore two n parameters, right? The probability of this word being there in a good, in a like document or in a dislike document. Uh, now, you could have uh, other representation that do take count into account and do take word position. You're going to have a lot more parameters, right? So if you think about uh, how many parameters you will need also to represent positions, You'll have to say something about the length of the document and then the position. You're going to have a lot more parameters. So, so we're go not going to uh, definitely not take position into account. At some level in one of the models, we're going to take count into account. Um, in all cases, we're going to assume that the probability of observing a word is independent of the location in the document. Um, and the count, as I said, we're going to incorporate it, so it will allow, give us two ways to think about generating a document. Okay, so here is way one. What we want to do is we want to be able to compute the probability of a label given a document. Bayes' rule says uh, that we're going to do argmax over, uh, I'm writing this as P of D given Y, P of Y given, uh, divided by P of D, I don't care about this. So it's the argmax of P of D given Y, P of Y. And the key question is going to be, okay, so what is the representation of P of D given Y? The probability of a document given that I know whether it's like or dislike. Uh, and this is where our assumptions are going to go in. So here is one set of assumptions that I can use. And this, last time I introduced a few probability distributions. I know that you've all seen this probability distribution before. If you don't, go back and check. I'm going to use these two probability distributions today as a way to uh, determine this probability distribution, P of D given Y. So under the multivariate Bernoulli distribution, to generate a document, first I'm going to decide what is the label. Once I decided what is the label, 
I'm considering a dictionary of words, and I'm going to choose a word, W, into the document with this probability, P of W given Y, which means there are two numbers here, right? So P of W uh, given like or dislike. If the size of the document uh, of the dictionary is, is N, that means that the probability of the document is the following probability. Uh, for each word, I have this term. P of W being in the document given the label times P of W not being in the document given the label. And the power BI or 1 minus BI is going to help me determine whether uh, the word actually occurs in the document or not. So if it's there, this is going to be 1, which means I'm going to count this in the product. And this is going to disappear because it's going to be it's going to be one. If it's not in the document, then I'm going to count this term, and this will turn to to be one, right? So this is just a compact way of saying, for all words in the dictionary, I'm adding one component, which is the probability of W being there or not, given the label. Okay? Everyone agrees that this is a way to write P of D given Y. And this is really the simplest way using Bernoulli distribution. Again, I have two uh, parameters here, the probability of four parameters, the probability of W being there or not there, given the label. And this BI is just uh, a technical way for me. Once I look at the document, I know the value of, of the Bs, right? I look at the document, I see whether W is there or not, then I am going to plug it in and get the right product. So this is just a technical way of writing a closed form expression before I observe the document. Okay, so now that I do this, everything uh, is simple, you know. I have this, I know how to estimate this, and I know how to estimate this, just counting. Okay? So this is one way. Just to summarize, the parameters that I have are priors. And for every word in the dictionary, I have these uh, numbers, four numbers. Every two of them actually are dependent, so really two independent parameters. Another way of thinking about it. So again, same thing. I want to compute P of D given Y. In this case, I'm going to assume uh, a different way of modeling the generation of the document. First of all, as before, I'm generating, uh, I'm deciding whether it's a good or bad document, like or dislike document. Uh, now, I'm deciding that I'm going to place capital N words into D, such that WI is placed with this probability, P of W I given Y. Now, of course, because I placed N documents, the sum 1 to N, P of W given Y, must be 1. Uh, and therefore, this is basically a multinomial uh, distribution. The probability of a document is, uh, this is the multinomial coefficient, N factorials over n1 factorial up to nk factorial, where the ni is the number of times wi appears in the document. So now I'm accounting for multiplicity. And here are the probabilities, p of wi given y to the number of times it appears. Uh, again, same number of parameters, and the summary will reveal this. So I have the priors. And for every word in the dictionary, I have this. But they represent somewhat different things. And therefore, I'm going to estimate them somewhat differently. Here I have more constraints on, on these numbers. OK, so in fact, you will solve a version of this problem in the homework. Uh, it will have a small dictionary, so it will be easier to, to compute. But uh, you will see that. 
it's not just counting, because you have these constraints that have n words in the, into d, and therefore uh, the sum of these probabilities. Every, every position that I'm looking at the document, I'm going to put a word there. And therefore, the sum of the probabilities uh, has to be one. Right? This is really the constraint I have now. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what is called the plate notation that people are using today in order to represent generative uh, processes. I actually don't like this representation so much, but because it's being used, it's worthwhile kind of knowing uh, about it. Uh, so, uh, so I'm explaining the two different distributions that we just talked about using this notation. In both cases, what you have is you have a probability distribution that governs the labels, same thing, and a probability distribution that governs uh, the words. The labels is the same thing. You know, you basically have, uh, where is it here? So a binary variable corresponds to a document D and a dictionary word W, that we agreed. Uh, text value one, if W appears, uh, the document label or topic uh, is governed by this data, right? So this is uh, simple. Uh, in this case, the Bernoulli case, independently of the document, I have a dictionary, and I'm just choosing words from the dictionary. And I'm going to choose this using this probability distribution. Uh, and the variable in the intersection of the plates is really uh, governed by both of them. What happens here is I have a notion of a document, and I'm placing things in the position, the first position in the document, the second position in the document, the capital N position of the document. So I'm placing here the document inside, uh, or the, the, the word generation inside the document, and, and I'm using a multinomial distribution with this additional constraint that I have a given size document, and I'm going to place things there. And I could place the same word multiple times, and it's going to account. So that's kind of the difference. Again, the, the notation uh, might be more confusing than helping. It's up to you. If you want, you can spend time uh, uh, understanding it. But the key thing is really... Um, what we talked about here. The two ways of representing P of D given Y, and there could be other ways that you imagine to represent the probability of a document given a label. You can imagine other probability distribution. So we gave two. Okay. Uh, there's a lot more to say about naive base, and I'm just going to tell you what's, uh, what's in the rest of this uh, uh, document. Uh, one general comment is that in many, many cases, uh, we can think about the general naive base scenario as a mixture of probability distribution. So essentially, you have components, and then you have a selection. Think about the selection as the label of which component is active now. Uh, and uh, this dictates the generative story, right? So. How do we create a document, for example? We first select which component, which label, if you want. And once I've selected this, I'm, generate, I'm deciding how to generate the document uh, according to this distribution. Overall, what I get is the probability of a document given uh, mu is just this total probability table. Uh, so this is one way to think about uh, the naive base scenario. What I have here in the rest is a couple of other examples. One of them is dealing with continuous uh, variables. So when we assume that <coughs> the probability distribution is Gaussian, I'm not going over the details. I just want to... Uh, so you've all seen this distribution. I just want to highlight one thing if you go over it. Uh, there's a lot of abuse of notation here. I mean, in many cases, we abuse our notations, but here specifically, because these are continuous variables, we actually don't know how to compute uh, P of X given Y. So we're going to deal with ratios uh, or imagine that we have really 
to make this more concrete. Imagine that we have this function that behaves like a probability distribution. It's not a really probability distribution, but it has all the properties that we need, specifically the naive base rule, and then we can proceed. So I'm just showing here how to go about doing it and how to do uh, the naive base in this case. Notice that in this case I'm always working with ratios exactly for the reason that we're dealing with continuous variables. Okay, a second uh, example that you have here that I'm not going to go into the details is hidden Markov models. We already talked about hidden Markov models. I just want to remind you it's more important that you'll understand what the questions are, that you'll understand what the solutions are. Uh, so this is hidden Markov models, right? We generate data this way. We, we have a state. Given a state, we generate an observation. We move to another state, we generate an observation, and so on. Uh, that means that we have the following probabilities, parameters that we need to estimate. We have to estimate the initial state. I started here with S1, P of S1. And if I have capital S parameters, I'm going to have capital S parameters here. I have transition probabilities. How do I know when I'm in a given state, which state I'm going to move to? So P of ST given ST minus 1. And this gives me S square parameters. And I have the observation probability. So when I'm in uh, this state, what governs the generation of the next observation? So this is P of O observation given P of S, given S. And this is number of S times number of O parameters. Okay? So these are the parameters. Now, I drew a graphical model because this is a good way to think about how this is generated, but this is also a good way to understand what are the assumptions that are making. Next week, we're going to talk in more details about how the graphical model actually uh, is a convention that tells us what assumptions we're making. In this case, I'm going to make this explicit. This, the assumptions are the probability of a state, ST, given everything that I've seen before, is just the probability of ST given the previous state. So if I want to decide what's the probability of S4 given everything else, I only care about S3. I don't care about previous states. This is the Markovian assumption. Assumption two is how do I determine the probability of an observation? The probability of the observation, say O3, given everything that happened before and what happened before, all the states up to S3 happened before, and all the observation up to O2 happened before. So the, the probability of OT, given everything that happened before, is just the probability of OT given the state it's in. It doesn't care about anything else. Given that, we can write uh, the joint probability distribution of what we see. Uh, here is an example. Uh, it's often uh, easy to think about these type of models as sequential models for language, either power speech tagging models or chunking models, where here I'm thinking about phrases, and for every word I'm going to think about, is it at the beginning of the phrase, B, inside the phrase or outside the phrase? So in this case, uh, brown, I'm thinking about names as my state. So, uh, Mr. Brown is a name. So, this is the beginning, and this is inside. This is already outside. And then Mr. Bob, again, beginning, inside, and this is already outside. So, these are the hidden states. When you give me a sentence like this, my goal might be to decide what are the names here. And I can encode it as deciding what are the states among BIO, and this gives me the answer to wh where are the names here. Is the modeling clear? Okay. So, uh, so this is really a shallow parsing problem, and, and the initial probability, state probability are, where do I start? Three probabilities. Transition probability is, how do I move from state to state? Probability of being in B, moving to B, being in B, moving to I, being in B, moving to O, and so on. 
and then I have the observation probability for each word in my vocabulary, what's the probability of producing it when I'm in B, and what's the probability of producing it when I'm I, and the same thing when I'm in O. Okay, so the computational question, or the typical computational question would be, here is a sentence, like this one, Mr. Brown blame Mr. Bob for something, give me the BIO sequence. And this will be equivalent to detecting the names in the sequence. Uh, okay, in more general uh, way, what are the computational problems that we have? We have the decoding problem, which is what I just said. Decoding is just a name where we say, find the most likely state sequence. So I'm giving the model. I already learned the model. I'm giving the parameters of the model. And I'm giving the observation, sort of the A, B, C, D, A, D here, or the Mr. Brown blame Mr. Bob, and find the most likely state sequence. So here is how I can write it. Find the most likely set of states, hidden states here, which is argmax over all possible states of P of states given observation. That's the computational problem. A second computational problem could be just given an observation, tell me what's the likelihood of this observation. So again, I, may, I have the model and the parameters, I have data, the observations, and give me what's the likelihood of, uh, to generate this data. So what's the probability of O, a given sequence of observations, given the parameters? So P of O given S times P of S, and I'm going to marginalize over all possible S's here. Right? So this is another potential computational problem. Notice that the way I've written here, it here, this, both of these are actually very expensive operations. Right? So what's the complexity of computing this? the way it's written here, yeah? It's S to the T, right? So number of states to the power of number of values in each state. Because I have to consider all sequences. For each sequence, I'm going to compute this. And then I'm going to do argmax. Similarly here, right? Because in order to compute this, I have to sum over S to the T components. In each case, I'm going to compute this, and then I'm going to sum. Now, we are going to, there are much better algorithms to do this, uh, but um, in principle, na a Bayesian theory solved the problems, right? So we know that what we have to do is we have to solve this argmax, and then the rest is just a computational problem. And of course, there is the training problem. Uh, do I say something more? OK. Uh, so, so there are two ways to train it. One is the supervised way. I'm going to give you both the sequence, A, C, D, A, D, and the corresponding uh, states. In this case, it's a very easy training process. Essentially, you do counting for each one of the parameters. Remember, these are the parameters that we are talking about. And if I give you both these and these, you just do counting and compute the probability of moving from B to B, the probability of moving from, of producing Mr. given that you are in B, and so on. So that's an easy uh, learning problem, the supervised. The unsupervised basically will assume that I'm only going to give you these observations. The ACDAD or the Mr. Brown may blame Mr. Uh, Bob, and I will not tell you the states. These are going to be hidden, and the question is how to estimate it. And this will require an algorithm that we're going to call an EM algorithm, and we're going to move on to uh, now. Questions? Okay, yeah. The answer is yes. The, the question, the issue is that it's going to change your model, right? So, 
So if you want to take this nice picture uh, and add features, what does it mean to add features? It means that you're going to say, you know what, O3 doesn't depend only on S3. It depends also, let's say, on S2. Right? Okay, on, on other things, could also depend on O2. It basically, this probabilistic model makes very strict assumptions on if I want to, when I'm writing a function of P of O3 as a function of the data that I observe, it only depends on S3. What you want is you want it to depend on other things. And you can do this. Uh, the, prob the model is going to be a lot more complicated. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it next week when we talk about general graphical models, because this is what it's going to become. Uh, and we're going to talk about it also next semester when we talk about more expressive models. But in general, you can do whatever you want. It's only that uh, the reason it's so easy to estimate parameters in this model is because these are very uh, clear independence assumptions, right? I did make these assumptions, uh, right? So P of OT, depending on, given everything else, really depends only on ST. Adding more features means uh, dropping these assumptions and making other assumptions. It's just going to become more complicated. The same thing is going to work, right? So I can always uh, use the base rule. It's only that uh, writing down the joint probability distribution is going to be a lot more expensive. Estimating it's going to be a lot more expensive. Uh, so, so what I'm not doing now is I'm not telling you, for example, how to solve this decoding problem. I, there are a couple of slides following here that will show this, show how you, you can do a dynamic programming algorithm. I want to stop here and actually move to deal with a simpler case of this unsupervised estimation dealing with uh, the EM algorithm. Okay, so as I said, there's a lot more slides and examples here. I'm not going to go over everything, um, uh, but you can certainly go over it and try to um, understand this. I, I'm going to move to the um, second part of today. And, okay, good excuse to actually remind you a few things. One is um, project reports. Um, uh, less than two pages. A lot of people ask questions about this. Basically, what I want uh, you to tell us, and I think you want to tell yourself, what progress have you made? What are your plans for the rest? You have about a month. What changes you've made to the original plan, given what you've learned in the last couple of weeks? What difficulties you have? Remember that there's about a month from now to the final report. And also remember that we fixed the date for the final exam a few weeks ago because there were questions on this. Questions on this? No questions. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Uh, so really, I'm placing what we are doing now in the context of what I call semi-supervised learning. Right? So we always talked, so far in the class, we always assumed that supervision is given to us. And all the learning algorithms assume supervision is given to us. In fact, that's the only thing we can do. I mean, we don't know how to learn without supervision. Sometimes the supervision is explicit, and sometimes... We pretend that we don't have supervision, but we actually make assumptions that allow us to convert it to supervision. And this is really what we're going to do uh, in many respects. So let's think about the following problem as a running example for us. So the problem is going to be, it's called propositional phrase attachment. So you look at these two sentences, or kind of parts of sentences, buy car with money, buy car with wheels, or with steering wheel. Now, you can see that the with in these two sentences is not the same word. It has two different meanings. In one case, you mean buy with money. 
In another case, we mean car with wheel, wheels or steering wheels or whatever you want it to be. So we call this with a with that is attached to the noun, and this with is attached to the verb. And really, this attachment is something that allows you to understand what the sentence means. How do you do this attachment? No idea. You probably know something. You have some knowledge that you brought from home, and you know that, you know, if this is somehow related to car, you probably want to attach it to the noun. If this is something that probably related to buy, you want to attach it to the verb. Uh, you bring some background knowledge. But from our perspective now, it's just a binary classification problem. You give me a sentence with a preposition, and I want to know, should I attach this preposition to the noun or to the verb? as an intermediate step uh, toward understanding what the sentence means. Problem clear? Okay, so we're going to look at it as a binary classification problem. I'm going to assume that all the examples that I have, I took away all the details from the sentence and just kind of stripped the sentence into these four components. The verb, the noun, the preposition, and the other noun that modifies uh, the preposition. So I have four features in each example. You can either take these four features as your example, or you can take all subsets, all possible conjunctions. You have four uh, features. All possible conjunctions are going to give you 15 features. Well, 16, but I don't care about the empty case. So 15 examples. Everyone is clear about how did they do this transformation? Okay, uh, hopefully by now you know about feature transformations. Uh, uh, and I'm going to use naive base for this algorithm. So um, to distinguish between noun attachment and v verb attachment, V. And my examples are these, x1 up to xn with the label. Okay, so, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to use naive base, which means... I'm going to estimate these parameters, P of n and P of v, priors, and given n, P of x1 given n up to P of x n given n, given v, P of x1 up to P of x n given v. And now you give me an example, say you gave me this example, x1 up to x n, with a question mark here, I'm going to compare these two products, right? Hopefully, nothing I'm saying here is new to you and is unclear to you. Okay? So, I'm, it's the product of the PXIs given the N and compared with the product of the P of XI given the Vs. Okay, let's take an example. Again, I'm doing this just to make sure that you understand naive base. Very simple, but still... There's something to understand. Let's assume I've seen 10 examples. And let's assume that the parameters I've estimated from these 10 examples are P of N and P of V are both 0.5. And these are the P of XI's given N. I'm just using four features. P of XI given the V. Uh, now, so I have the model, right? I learned the model. Now you give me a new example, say the example is 1, 0, 0, 0, I can figure out what my prediction is. To figure out the probability of n, p of n given x, is I'm multiplying the probabilities from the n row, and which probabilities do they multiply? First of all is the prior 0.5. For x1, x1 is on, so it's 0.75 x2 is off, so it's 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. It matter whether it's on or off, actually. Same thing I'm going to do for v, and I got these numbers. This is just proportional to the probability. It's not really the probability because I did not normalize. But this is sufficient to tell me that I want to predict n. Right? Questions? Okay. So now, let's assume that in addition to my 10 labeled examples, 
someone also gave me a hundred examples that are not labeled. Okay? What do I do? I mean, will this help me in any way? What do you think? Will help? Will not help? Intuitively, you want to say, well, of course, it should help, right? You get more data, but it's, un it's not labeled. Any idea what you could do with it so that it helps? Yeah? Okay, so here is a suggestion. I already have a model for my 10 examples. I'm going to label these 100 examples, and I know how to do this. I just did it for this example, 1, 0, 0, 0. So I know how to label examples. Now I'm going to have 100 labeled examples, and I'm going to add them to my data set and train. What do you think? Good idea, bad idea, okay idea? Who thinks it's a good idea? No one thinks it's a good idea? Who thinks it's an excellent idea? You don't have uh, supporters here. Okay, other suggestions if you don't like this idea. What's, what's the downside of this idea? Let's, let's, uh, could add noise, right? Because if your model is not so good, uh, because you just learned it based on 10 examples, you will add noise, and now you're going to learn from very noisy data. So how can you uh, correct this suggestion? It's still, you know, we want to use this data somehow, right? So, yes? So, so instead of picking the label, do what? Uh, give just a fractional label. What does it mean, a fractional label? So what is really happening for this example? We say it's a noun example. Are you sure it's a noun example? How sure are you it's a noun example? Right? So the probability of this is, what is it? Four times the probability of this, right? What if it was 1.01, .01, the probability of that? Right? It's just a little bit more uh, toward the noun than the verb. Would you also want to label it noun and keep on going? So you will definitely add noise. But in this case, it's like the ratio is 1 to 4. Maybe it's OK. So, so what kind of idea does this give you? Suggestions? So how would you correct your algorithm? So, so you have two options, really. So, uh, so again, I'm reminding you that we know how to deal with examples. We just did it for with one zero zero zero. So, if we want to use it to improve the classifier, we really have two options. One is we can make the predictions and believe them. This is the original suggestion, right? And of course, this might add noise. So maybe we'll just believe some of them, not all of them. How would you decide which fraction of the predictions to believe? Well, you have probabilities, right? For each prediction that you made here, you know what's the probability of uh, x being n and v. You can put a threshold and say, you know, if I have an example for which my probability 
of one of the labels is more than 0.9, I'm going to take it. Otherwise, I'm not going to take this example. So rather than using the all 100 examples that I gave you, you just use some of them. But you'll be confident in your prediction, and therefore the chance that you'll noisify your data is going to be smaller. So that's one option. Another option is I can assume fractional labels. So really, the n-labeled examples could be with p of nx. I'm normalizing here. It will be an n with this probability. It will be a v example with this probability. Now, no one said in naive base, when I'm adding stuff, I'm counting, how many times did I see an n example? On how many times did I see x1 being on in an n example? And how many times I saw x3 off in a v example? No one said that I have to count integers. I could count fractions and add fractions for the same price, right? Think about the algorithm that you're doing, the estimation algorithm. Who said that you have to add integers? You can add fractions, so you can add these numbers. And then you'll also get estimation of probabilities by adding these fractions. So each example of the new 100 will have a label this example is going to be 3 quarters n and 1 quarter v. This example is going to be, you know, 5, 6 n and 1, 6 v and so on. And notice that those examples that you're not really sure about, close to 0.5, really will not contribute anything. Because they'll be counted both on the v side and on the n side in about the same way. So you, you, you actually handle the noise problem this way. So these are really the two key options that you have. And uh, this is actually what we're going to do. So it really gave us two algorithms, the threshold algorithm, the fractional algorithm. Uh, and, and you know, there are other algorithms uh, that we can use. But from our perspective now, we can take this algorithm, use them iteratively, you know, keep on going. Estimate your model. If you used the algorithm that had a threshold, you chose only 10 of the unlabeled examples. You learn a new model. Now you can go back and revisit the example and maybe relabel them or take a new example to label and so on. Um, and, and, you know, you can do the same thing for any other classifier, not only to naive base. And people are doing this for other classifiers. Uh, all you need is you need some notion of confidence for the classification in order to follow up with this. And as I said earlier today, we can develop a notion of confidence or probability for any of the learning algorithms we talked about. Uh, okay. So, and, and this is just one approach uh, to semi-supervised learning. There are other very related uh, algorithms uh, that I'm not going to touch on. What I'm going to continue here is with the following thing. If instead of 10 labeled examples, now I'm starting with a different number of examples. Zero this time. What do I do now? So if it was instead of 10 labeled examples, 11, it would say stay with the same algorithm, right? If I change the 10 to zero, what changes, and how would you handle it? Suggestions? Yeah? Okay. What does that mean, clustering the data? Okay, so I split it to groups, and? But I still don't know which is N and which is V. All right, so, so it's a good idea to know something about the data, but what I want is, at least the way we looked at it before, uh, when you, I gave me the new example, 1, 0, 0, 0, you were able to estimate whether it's an N or a V. The clustering is not going to help me 
here. It will tell me maybe, well, I have two groups of examples. This 1, 0, 0, 0 is more like this. But is it a V or an N? I don't know. Eventually, actually, I will, if I have labels, I've clustered it. But the other way around, at least immediately, I don't see how it's going to help me associate, assign labels to this. Yes? What does it mean, uniform? How do I start? Okay, so, so I started, when I started with 10 labels, I estimated some model, and I had some prob I knew for every example that you give me, I have some probability that it's a V and some probability it's an N. And you just say, let's assume it's 0.5. I can do this. Other suggestions? Yeah? Define a what function? A distance function. So that's similar to the clustering approach, right? So I want to know how similar are the examples, but still I don't know how do I get a V or an N label. That's what I need. And I'm going to start with your suggestion. So essentially you're saying, let's guess. I'm going to start with some guess. I'm going to assume that I know how to label an example somehow. And just like I did it here, I, st I continued iteratively. I made a guess. Using the guess, I estimated the probability distribution. Now I had a new model. I looked again at the data, estimated, classified them, and estimated the probability. So this is what we're going to do. We're basically going to guess, just like we did for the 10 labeled example. This was maybe an educated guess. This is going to be a less educated guess. But the algorithm is going to be the, call, the, the same algorithm. I'm going to make a guess, continue as above, running naive base. So let's, let's make this a little bit more concrete. So, so the algorithm that we're going to uh, pursue is, going to, is called EM, expectation maximization, for a reason that we'll see a little bit later today even. Uh, it's a class of algorithms, just like naive base is a class of algorithm. It depends on the probability distribution, the underlying probability distribution that you're assuming, that is used to estimate the probability distribution in the presence of missing attributes. What's missing here is the label. You got data. You don't know whether it's an N data or a V data. Uh, using it requires an assumption on the underlying probability distribution because we need to know how to estimate P of N, P of V, P of X7 given V, and so on. Uh, and it turns out that the algorithm is really sensitive to these assumptions. If the assumption is good, the algorithm is very, very good. If it's not so good, the algorithm is not going to do uh, so well. But the important thing is that, in general, it's known to converge to a local maximum of the maximum likelihood function, which means you may want to start it multiple times until you, uh, you get something. So let's, let's start with a simple example. Again, we're going to keep the motivation from the NV problem, but I'm going to move to a coin problem. So let's assume that I have uh, three coins. I'm going to call them coins 0, 1, and 2. Each one of them comes with its own probability for head, uh, alpha, P, and Q. And I'm going to imagine multiple scenarios uh, for, uh, for coin tossing. Here is one scenario. I toss one of the coins six times. I didn't tell you which one. I got H, H, T, T, H. And I'm asking you which coin is more likely to produce the sequence. Which coin is more likely to produce the sequence? I didn't give you the numbers, alpha, p, and q, but you can give me a sentence that determines how would you decide you know how to do this?
Let's assume I do give you numbers for alpha, p, and q. How would you choose which one generate this, that sequence? Okay. Maybe I'll ask the people there at the end that are busy. What do you think? What, what should the... Uh, how do I estimate the probability of uh, whether it's alpha or p or q that generated the sequence? The, the, the shortest sentence that you can come up with, what would you do? G give me one sentence that is your decision rule. Yes, that's what I was looking for. So, you know that the probability of H here is 3 over 4. You're going to choose the parameter that is closest to 3 over 4 and say, that's the most likely con that have generated this sequence. Everyone agrees with that? Not so difficult. Here is another more difficult question, perhaps. Scenario 2. I'm going to first toss coin 0. If it's head, I'm going to toss coin 1. If it's tail, I'm going to toss coin 2. And I'm going to give you this data. H, and then a sequence, T, and then a sequence, H, and then a sequence, where the first one is the coin 0, and the rest is what I tossed, whatever coin I tossed later. The question is, in this case, I'm asking you a harder question. I want you to estimate the most likely value for P, Q, and alpha. What's the most likely value of alpha here? What's the most likely value of alpha here? What? 0.75. So you observe H, T, H, H, and therefore, and you know that this was produced by alpha. What's the most likely value of, let's say, P here? P is coin 1. Or let's do coin 2. It's easier. Coin 2. Coin 2 is here, right? So what's the most likely value of coin 2? It's a half, right? So that's an easy problem. You know how to do it. Scenario 3. Same thing. Toss coin 0. If it's head, toss coin 1 many times. If it's tail, toss coin 2 many times. Now I'm observing this sequence. What's the difference between here and scenario 2? I didn't tell you what was the outcome of the first coin toss. Zero. I just told you what happened. Estimate the most likely values of PQ and alpha. What are you missing here? It's a syntactic question. What's the difference between scenario two and scenario three? Doesn't require a lot of thinking now. What's the difference? Yeah. Um, the sequences are, are samples of distributions, but you don't know which one. I don't know which one, so I drop the label. You can think about these red things here as the labels. I drop the label. So I gave you the examples from the NV story, but I didn't tell you whether it's N or V. It's unlabeled data. And it's the same difficulty, right? Had you known the labels, you can run your naive base algorithm. You can do the counting that you did to tell me here what's the alpha, P, and Q. Now you cannot do it. This is where we want to use EM. So think about it this way, right? So you have a coin, coin zero. You toss it, and as a function of what you get here, you toss the others. Which one did you toss? I don't know, but I tossed it n time. And I want to estimate the probability here on these wires 
and the probability that led to coin zero. So this is what EM is going to do to us. Now, you can imagine how you do it, and I want you to think about it. There is really no known analytical solution to this problem in the general setting. So we don't know how to compute a closed form values of P and Q. What we know is we know how to come up with an iterative algorithm, very similar to the iterative algorithm that we kind of discussed uh, in the last few minutes. And this iterative algorithm is going to uh, maximize the likelihood of the data. Uh, or, uh, in fact, it's going to find a local maximum of the likelihood of the data. And that's going to be the algorithm that uh, we're going to start with next time. But I want you to come with a little bit more energy so you can help me uh, develop the algorithm. I mean, all the questions I'm asking are really easy questions. And even if you don't know the answer, trying something uh, is going to help. Because it's going to help you and it's going to help me to figure out you know, where, where we should go. Okay, so, so let's stop here uh, and I'll see you on Thursday.